How wonderful to be here. I'm just going to take a moment, Father Paul. Shall we just, both you and I, just pause for a second after this um, introduction, just, just to tune in and to try and shake off some of the complexities of the technological issue. <laughs> ah, take a deep, big, deep breath. And here we are together. This is just so lovely. You know, the last time we saw each other was, I don't know, four years ago or something, when, when we were walking in the magical forest of Brocéliande in, yes, in, in yes. Brittany. Wasn't, wasn't that superb? And we had met in, um, at the, the, the church of the, um, the, the Celtic Orthodox Church, at their church in the forest there. Um, and that's when we first met, I suppose, about a few years before that, wasn't it? Yes. We uh, were from the States. And so, so, um, so what, I wanted, what I wanted to do is to structure this interview in this way. I thought, let's talk about your life. Let's use the story of your life, the kind of arc of your life, as the scaffolding or as a structure to then talk about, you know, the, the question of spirituality, mysticism, the search for God, uh, for spirit, and uh, other such questions. Um, so, and when we when we had our preparation around this, um, it, it was so so interesting to hear. And and it's, I asked you if your life fell into three acts, <laughs> and you you said it did. And so, shall we, shall we start um, by looking at Act One, which starts in 1942. So you're almost 80 years old, uh, 78. And, and uh, so that's a, a, a wonderful span of time, born uh, in the middle of the Second World War. And tell me what, in, the, in that period, what was your first spiritual experience, would you say? Well, it's always a bit embarrassing to talk about things that are so intimate. Uh, it reminds me a little bit of a part of a poem by Emily Dickinson, a great mystical poet from New England, where I grew up, where I was born and grew up. And she says, I'm nobody. Who are you? Are you nobody too? <laughs> then there's a pair of us. Don't tell, they'll advertise, you know. <laughs> so, uh, I, I, I know. And when, when, we, when we prepared this, I, 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 had to, I had to encourage, just so everybody knows, I had to encourage Father Paul to talk about his personal life and his story because, because um, he, he wanted to focus on on the mystical and 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 what was uh, self-effacing, if I can say that. Uh, so, but I'm, so I'm encouraging you, and I'm being difficult. So, so, so uh, well, the, the point is, you asked when I began looking for God, uh, yeah. but it was God who was looking for me. Ah. It was the other way around. Uh, if I found Him, it's only because He manifested Himself to me, and not myself asking, you know, I want to know you, I want to love you, and so forth. Okay, so t tell us how that happened. Well, I was a, an altar boy, and I was on the lower step leading up to the altar. I was about eight years old at the time, and all of a sudden, my spirit left my body and went up to, there, there was like a cupola at the top, and went up there, and I could see my body down below, but it all felt perfectly normal. There didn't seem to be anything strange about it, and there before me, seated, was uh, Mother Mary, what we would call the Theotokos, or the Mother of God. And on her knee was the Christ child, just as you often see her portrayed. And uh, she asked me, she said... Uh, um, Katie, be... Katie New Newnham, uh, your mic is on, just so you know. So we're getting a bit of noise coming from your mic. If you're able to mute it, that would be great. Sorry. Oh, the so so the, the Blessed Mother asked me, she said, will you be my priest? And uh, of course, eight-year-old, what do I understand what that means? I don't, you know. So I said, well, yes. I, and, and then I went back into my body. But it all appeared so normal and natural to me. Because 
I think children, I, I think most people when they're young have some kind of, call it a mystical manifestation or a spiritual manifestation or however you want to word it. Mm. And uh, I never thought to talk about it because I just assumed everybody had the same kind of thing. I, 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 yes, well, that's an interesting question. But so what happened? Um, what happened then? Did you did you then just from that age of eight want to go into the priesthood? Was that your ambition from then onwards? Yes, I, I knew I was to be a priest. Yes. Oh, okay. It was very clear and I, I never doubted it. It was, as I say, it's a very strange state of affairs because you're you're into a different kind of a reality, but again, you just think it's normal, and it really is. Yeah, yeah, it really is. So, when did you become a priest? I became a priest uh, in 1969. So that was that was when you were when you were. I was. Did you, did you come out of college and, and you went to the you went to the, uh, Notre Dame? You did. Uh, you did Harvard Divinity School. Was I taught was, at Harvard Divinity School. But oh. I studied. Uh, I studied in a Catholic uh, university first, right. and studied for the priesthood there. We did theology and philosophy, and so forth. And uh, and then later on, and then I spent thirty years in a uh, in a monastery. And, and was then, that in Quebec? It was. It was located in Quebec. Yes. Yeah. Uh, but they sent me out uh, to many different places. Uh, I spent 15 years in the Dominican Republic, living among the, the very poorest of the poor. I mean, uh, people were so poor, they would have one meal every other day. And I can still remember how heartrending it was hearing a mother or a father telling the child, well, it's not your turn to eat today. Today, mm. Carlos and Maria will eat, but tomorrow, uh, Miguel and, and Ana will eat. And one meal every other day, that's how poor they were. Let's see. And uh, living with them, and I learned many things there. It mm. was a great awakening for me because I realized many of the things I had learned in theology, like moral theology, uh, didn't apply. It didn't apply to these people. They were in a very different culture and frame, frame of mind and possibilities. And uh, so it was as valuable, if not more, to me than the actual theological and philosophical studies I had done. Isn't that interesting? So you, and, and did you have, during those 15 years in the Dominican Republic, were you, were you, did you have internal spiritual experiences or was your spiritual experience actually being out there working with the poor in the external world as it were well that was part of it uh, being there in the uh, external world that was part of it but uh, we were living in such poverty i mean myself uh, <laughs> i was given 40 dollars to go there and live for six months with 40 dollars I don't know how many pounds that is, but it's not much. Yeah. And but but we did have uh, fruit trees on the property. But I realized I never lacked for anything. At least at least I had a grapefruit baby to eat that day. And I began to feel very clearly the presence of Christ with me. And I learned just to abandon myself to God completely. Don't fret, don't worry, don't even go out begging for anything. And everything came. It was extraordinary. I remember one day, I didn't even have 25 cents to take the, uh, the public transportation to the, uh, to the post office where I was receiving mail. So I walked, it was about five miles. I walked, went in and I told the, the fellow, I said, do you have anything for me? They, it was a very small office and they had just these little cubby holes behind the counter. And uh, the fellow there, I remember, even remember his name, Radames. I said, is there anything for me? He said, oh, no, Father. He said, the, the truck only comes in from the capital in an hour. Oh, I said, but could you look? Well, he said, maybe you didn't understand me. He said, nothing comes in or goes, I'm the only one here. Nothing comes in or goes out except through my hands, and the truck hasn't arrived yet. Well, I said, just to please me, would you look? Well, he said, if it's that easy to please you, I'll look. 
Yeah. And there was an envelope in my little cubby hole. Yeah. And no stamp, no return address, not even a full address, just in Spanish, Padre Pablo, Father Paul. Mm. I said, well, you're the only one that I know of. It must be for you. So he gave it to me, and inside was a $100 American bill. Wow. And, and things like happen like repeatedly. Uh, that's when I realized, you know, the, the unity, the intimacy with God is so intense and so thorough that if we just learn to forget ourselves and abandon ourselves, everything works. Well, like the scripture said, everything works to the good for those who love God. Yeah. <laughs> that's how I would put that, it. That, that, that's lovely. And and then when you was it was it quite strange going back to Canada um, after those after that time in the Dominican Republic? Well, all in all, I had been I lived for four years in Italy, the uh, French West Indies, Puerto Rico, different places. Yeah. And when I finally came back to North America after thirty years, I found so many changes. So many changes. I, I I recognized the buildings and the streets, but not the people. Really, there had been a there had been quite a change in, in the mentality of, of the people. And is that when you shifted into your second act? Uh, no, no, this was the second act. Sorry, yes, the first act was up to sure. sort of the age of uh, you know twenty seven or something, and then there was the monastery. Your second act, and 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 working. Uh, uh, as a missionary, were you? did you consider yourself a missionary? Well, I, I didn't think of myself as a missionary, but just as a, as a person to, how can I put it, just to radiate the love of Christ to people. Okay. And, and that and, was, and, and then when you came, when you came back, what, what, what changed for you? How did you deal with the fact that you didn't recognize it in the same way anymore? Well, there had been a lot of changes. For, for example, uh, I had never seen a microwave before, mm. and even the language had changed. I, I visited some people, and uh, they said they had a microwave, and we're going to heat something up for them. She says, says, well, we'll nuke it for you. I said, oh, my goodness. <laughs> nuke it. <laughs> Terrifying. Was, Terrifying. But that's the way people... Become, had you become a bishop by then? Uh, yes, I had been become a bishop yeah you become a you you were a you were a bishop and this is in the catholic church right a, a branch of the catholic church uh and then i was reconsecrated a bishop in the orthodox church yes because which, this really interests me is is how, because you made the change from uh the catholic church to uh, was it the main the was it the roman catholic church you were in? it was a branch of the roman catholic church because uh, during the uh, the ecumenical the uh Vatican II Council, hmm. there was a lot of confusion and breakaways and a whole, many, many different groups hmm. uh, just uh, were, were not under the jurisdiction of Rome per se, but they were, they were Catholics. They were Catholics and it was a tra traditionalist Catholic, I seem to remember you. Traditionalist saying. Catholic, yes. that's right. And then you found it, you found it, when you got back, you found it restricted, it was time to leave, wasn't it? Uh, I found it very stifling spiritually because it was very much according to the letter of the law, you might say, a mm. kind of a legalistic uh, attitude towards, uh, towards belief. And mm. of course, my, my many years, uh, uh, as I said, living the experiences that I had, uh, no longer corresponded to that at all. Mm. And, had uh, you been to India by then? Uh, yes, yes. Yes, because uh, you, I, tell I us about what India. happened in India. Well, uh, I was being invited to speak at the uh, Vedanta Society in Providence, Rhode Island, still in New England. And then they said, well, we're having an international conference and uh, we'd like you to, to give a talk there on religion in the modern world. So that's how I got to Calcutta, <laughs> mm. to see Ramakrishna's birthplace and so forth. It, uh, that, that's and they were so afraid I was going to be shocked by the poverty I saw in Calcutta. And I wasn't at all. I, I was so used to it. You were used to it. It didn't, yeah. it didn't phase me in the least. And and did you look at Hinduism at all as a religion? Well, you know, how shall I put it? I think all manifestations of faith, religion, 
whether Christian or Jewish or Islamic or Hindu or Buddhist or whatnot, uh, these are all people who are striving for, uh, for truth. And there is truth everywhere. And it, it reminds me of a little poem of, of Hafiz, the, mm. the uh, Iranian mystical boy, the Persian. He said, would you think it odd if Hafiz said, I am in love with every church and mosque and temple and any kind of shrine because I know it is there that people say the different names of the one God. So that's how I came to look upon all of that. <laughs> well, well, that's lovely because this afternoon I was listening again to the um, recording you made for the Fintry Trust back in 2008. Um, I, I had met you in, uh, in Brasilia, in, in, in Brittany, and, and I was um, doing a retreat we, at the Fintry Trust. We, we, we went to Merlin's tomb, right? We went to Merlin's tomb, We went yes. to Merlin, yeah. Yes. And when I was at Fintry, I discovered a CD of yours uh, where you're talking about mystical poets, which I have here somewhere. And um, here we are, um, Father Paul Dupuy, Mystical Poets. And um, it's, it's a beautiful set of a recording where you talk about... Um, a Jewish mystic, um, uh, Hafiz Rumi, um, Basho, you know, um, Chuang Tzu, and Milarepa, the Tibetan, and um, St. John of the Cross. And, and mm. you know, what I learned from listening to you talking about that is that, I mean, you are a universalist in the sense of, of recognizing this perennial um, wisdom tradition. Would you? Would you? Is that fair to to say you're a universalist well, in that sense? Uh, yes. Yes. I mean, in, in the sense that truth is everywhere to be found if we know how to look. Mm. If we can purify our inner sight and look at the manifestations of God everywhere, mm. uh, He's everywhere to be found. Yes. And uh, the one thing that stunned me very much is I began looking at. Rumi and Hathis and John of the Cross and so forth, was that they're all mystical poets. That is to say, they entered into mystical states of ecstasy. But in that state of ecstasy, uh, they lost all awareness of their individual selves. There was God. Hmm. And they were one with God. They forgot what religion they belonged to. They forgot what culture they belonged to, what period of history they were living in. All, there was nothing but God. And I realized that this ecstasy, this experience of ecstasy was universal. Whether they were Sufis or, or, or Christians or Jews or whatever, it was all the same experience. And so and, and I don't you, think we, that, that kind of, it nips any kind of fanaticism in the bud, doesn't it? Exactly. And, and, and you were talking about the freedom that the mystics were seeking as well. And I suppose right. that was what, that was, what hap was happening you, for you on the cusp of moving into your third act, as it were, where you, um, you had been in this um, monastery for 30 years, or connected with the monastery, and you found, you came back, you found it too legalistic and confining so what did you do how but did you mind you there are some wonderful people there I, yeah. I don't mean to speak against them but yeah. i just felt i needed more uh, my lungs needed more air to breathe with so what did you do well i i came to the united states came back after 30 years and uh, <clears throat> eventually uh, taught at the divinity school at harvard uh in the french the the french department because i spoke french and uh, began meeting all kinds of different people. And it was, it was terribly interesting, but one of the persons I met was a fellow, uh, a French gentleman, Thierry, and he wanted a book of a friend of his translated into English and asked if I would do it. Well, Thierry's father was ambassador of France to India at one point, and then Jordan and, and different countries. And uh, but he was working in IT uh, kind of, and he was stationed in London, 
And then I went to Fintry in 2008 uh -huh. and uh, to do some research on mystical poets. That was one of the purposes there. Because yeah. they have a wonderful library there. Yeah. And uh, so I emailed him thinking he was still in London. I said, well, we could get together and have tea or coffee together or a meal together. And then he said, I've spoken to my father, the ambassador, retired at this point. He said, he absolutely wants to meet you. And uh, I'm going to send you a ticket from uh, London to Paris. And then eventually he had another book he wanted translated in Lausanne, Switzerland, called Mystical, uh, Mystical Mathematics. And, uh, but finally we didn't do it. He didn't have the funds <laughs> for the translation. But he said, my father will come to meet you. And he'll take you to his beautiful apartment in Neuilly, which is in Western Paris, a beautiful part of Paris. And uh, so he picked me up and thinking we we're going to go to this beautiful apartment of his, I see he's going west and west. And all of a sudden I see signs shot cathedral. And I said, oh, I said, we're not going to Neuilly, are we? We're already by shot. Oh, he said, I'm going to take you to my home, not to his apartment. Four and a half hours later, <laughs> we ended up uh, at uh, a 15th century castle. But I mean a castle, you know, with a moat and, and the drawbridge and a real castle. Hmm. And so we stayed there. That's where he lived. And uh, then he, his wife had died two years earlier. And he said, uh, I, we have some monks nearby. There are monks nearby, and they were angels for my wife in the last two years while she was dying of cancer. I'd like to go in and see them. Would you come tomorrow? I said, well, sure. But when he said monks, I just assumed in France they were Benedictine monks or uh, Cistercian monks. Uh, but come to find out, uh, they were Celtic Orthodox, of whom I had never heard. I didn't even know they existed. And that was it. That was instantaneously, inwardly, I was told this is the place. And you arrived at that lovely, lovely um, s spot in, 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 in the forest. Am I holding it? Uh, right, right. There. And, uh, and, right. You met, and you met the primate of the church, who uh, I have a photograph of him here in, in his druid robes. I don't know if you've seen that photograph. <laughs> um, yes, uh, he, he had studied druid, druidry. Y yes, exactly. Uh, and, uh, that's the sort of connection with me because my my teacher, my druid teacher, Ross Nichols, was ordained mm -hmm. um, as a deacon of the Orthodox Celtic Church um, mm -hmm. in in at the same place uh, prior to Mile being there, and so meeting Mile was was tremendous, and and this um, uh, you know link was was forged, and and like you, I fell in love with the place. It has a well, it's beautiful atmosphere, doesn't it? Yeah, you know, it certainly does. Uh, and Bishop Mael, who's may he rest in peace, uh, he and Bishop Mark, who's the, the primate today, they both were searching for, for higher spiritual realities, uh, just as I had been to. And so that brought them to Druidry and then from Druidry, uh, which was just, I wouldn't even say a stepping stone because the, it, it's been so incorporated into the true Christian teaching Mm. that they don't have any real contradiction there. No, and one of the little signs of that is when you see there's that new cross that they've erected, Celtic cross, just at the entrance. You'll see the druid yes. sign of the Arwen, uh, the three bars <laughs> of light is actually on the cross, and it's also right, in the forest right. as well. Um, and, and actually on the top of the cross, on the top of the cross is like a little roof, yes. and that is supposed to be like the Shekinah, the Jewish presence of God. Uh -huh, so uh -huh. there are symbols in the cross, yes. Yes, exactly. So, so you decided to, to become, to be ordained, or whatever the term is, to transfer no, your... I, I was told inwardly by God, this is the place. Yeah. Again, like I said, I never went looking for God. He mm. kept... But I've become God's spoiled brat. It is. <laughs> <laughs> he just spoils me. And, and then what happened is you were asked to found a monastery in the United States. Is that right? That's right. Yeah. I assumed, having lived for 30 years under monastic vows, 
that I would just renew them and continue continue them uh, at uh, Saint Dole, which is the, uh, the the monastery that you just showed the picture of in Brittany, yeah. in France, yeah. Western France. But uh, Bishop Mayel told me, "Oh no," he says, "You're going back to the United States." So, did you want to? Was, did you want to stay there? Was a part of you? Did you just want to stay when you got to? Oh, I, 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 I love the place. I yeah, love yeah. the place. Uh, when I met Bishop Mayel, and then we talked and everything, and it was just extraordinary because when I arrived, one of the priests came to greet us, and he asked what part of France I was from. I said, "No, no," I said, "I'm American." Oh, he says, where? I said, Massachusetts. Not expecting they had ever heard of Massachusetts. Texas, California, yes, okay. But Massachusetts? And uh, he, his eyes opened. He says, just a minute. I'll be right back. Came back, and he says, Bishop Mayer wants to meet you. And Bishop Mayer said, I hear you're from Massachusetts. I said, yes. I said, I am. He said, well, where in Massachusetts? And I was decided I was going to, because I was living in Boston, Cambridge area, you know, uh, so teaching. And I said, no, I said, uh, I was going to say I'm from the Boston area. Figure if they had heard of Massachusetts, that may be the only city they would have heard of. But what came out of me, and it really wasn't me, I know it wasn't me, I said, I grew up in Gardner. Bishop Mile didn't bat an eyelash. He says, do you know Holy Rosary Church? I said, yes, that's where I was the altar boy. That's where I first saw the, the, uh, the that that apparition there, mm. and uh, and so and asked various questions like that, and then come to find out, he he's eighteen years older was eighteen years older than I, but he had in the elementary school taught by the nuns there, a teacher who later taught me when I was in seventh grade. Mm. We actually had the same teacher, and then uh, he described a house to. He said, "What's the name of the street behind the church?" I said, it's uh, Regan, not like President Reagan, R-E-G-A, a Regan Street. Oh, yes. He described the house. He said, do you know that? I said, yes. It's right behind the boys' play area. I see it every day. He said, that's where I was born and grew up. Because mm. his family was of, no of nobility. So you both, came, you both came from the same town? Same town, same church, same school. Yeah. And it's, it's a matter of fact, I mean, you grew met. up I mean, these are not coincidences, you I know. I know, I know, yes. So I literally, I literally grew up one street behind his. And if I had thrown a stone from my house, it might have landed on his roof. Yeah. But I never met him. He was 18 years older. Yes, yes. How amazing. And, and, and he told you to go to the States and found a monastery. That's right. That's and... That must have been hard. So at that time, how, you were, you were, that was too sad. That, that, you were in your 60s then, yes, something like that? You were about 60 um, or something? I'm 78 now. Hmm. Uh, you, maybe you can do the mathematics for me. <laughs> yeah, how long ago, how long ago did you, did you set off to the States to do the, to start? Oh, the uh, in the year 2000. Yes, I would have been in the 60s. You're right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So ten, 10 years ago. So you were 68. So at the age of 68, you, you, you went to the States, and, and how did you know, it's a big country, how did you know where to go? Well, I went back to Massachusetts where I grew up. Yeah. And then, uh, of course, not being in monastery anymore at that time, I had to work. Yeah. And uh, I met my brother, and we went walking at Harvard Square in uh, Cambridge, Harvard University. And then I saw a sign in the window uh, of a of a bookstore, international bookstore, uh, which I had bought books from years earlier when I was in college, and but they had moved, and I said, "Oh, they've moved. They're no longer on Massachusetts Avenue." And then there was a sign in the window: uh, "We need a director for the French department of the." It was an international bookstore. Yeah. I said, "There I am. That's my job." And so <laughs> I started there, and from there, uh, they they met me from Harvard, and they came and asked me if I would teach uh, the, what they call the French theological course there. So, so you were te teaching there, and then you ended up in, where? what part of the States are you in now? I'm in Virginia now because uh, I knew they wanted me to, uh, by 2008, the year I went to Fintry, hmm. uh, 
and went to France, then I met the, the church in uh, Saint Dole. Mm -hmm. And uh, so they told me I was to come back to the States, but we prayed and prayed. And uh, it was Virginia that kept coming up. I had never been to Virginia. Mm -hmm. And Virginia came up, so I rented a little apartment, started looking around until I found what is now where the monastery is. How fantastic. How, how incredible. And, and you're, you're focused on, I know you go back to France for retreats and to... I, can, I try to go yearly. Yeah. Uh, I couldn't go this year because of the COVID. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And are you building up a community down there in Virginia? We have a little monastery built, and uh, there was an old chicken coop. I've torn that down, and I want to build a little chapel there. Uh, bless you. Bless Thank you. you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> to begin with, uh, already beginning to make plans for building a little chapel for the public. I mean, they can come into the monastery, but... I have a kind of an oratory within the monastery. Right. Yeah. Right. And, and whilst you're doing all this, you're also focusing on a book, I believe. Yes, a, a book on the mystical poets of the world, of, of the various different mystical traditions. Mm. And, uh, and why... It's been so of, all, of all the things that you could write about, why have you chosen them well because i think it's so extraordinary uh, we're entering into into a new millennium and i believe that I, I firmly believe that christianity as we know it is going to undergo momentous changes hmm. that uh, the old ways the old uh, disciplines perhaps the the old practices all the essence will be kept but it's going to be in a much more open and broader way that uh, it will be based all on love and not just obedience, for example. Right. That, that's a powerful idea and very beautiful, I think. And, and you, in your 2008 talk at Fintry, you talked about um, the, 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 what you identified as the sort of four, the, the three stages of, that these mystical poets were going through remembering the mirror, the cleansing of the mirror, and then beyond the mirror. Um, yes. I wonder if you could say, will you be writing about that in the book? Uh, I'm glad you reminded me. <laughs> uh, you see, remembering the mirror is it's when we first come into contact with uh, a reality was not just the meat and potatoes every day. We begin to become aware there's much more. And I've heard a number of people tell me that uh, when they were young, they wondered, well, where do I come from? They didn't feel they came from where they were born. And wondering, are my parents really my parents? But I know I'm not adopted. Uh, there was that wonderment. There was that idea that things were not what they appeared to be, that there was a much deeper, greater reality. And uh, so that's the becoming aware of the mirror. Becoming aware that there's much more than just meets the eye. And then the second phase, the looking, the looking into the mirror, we realize that we have material eyes, material ears. We have the senses of the body. But then we realize that we have the senses of the spirit too. What St. Augustine calls, for example, the spiritual eye. And uh, we begin to see the things of the spirit. Uh, what we traditionally call the heart, uh, the, the, the spirit of the heart, the nous in Greek, nous. Mm. Uh, that, uh, th that just as we have the three stages, we realize that man is composed of, of three parts. His body, which we all know, but which is destined to, to die at one point. Or mm. It's like taking off your shirt. You're going to change your garment. <laughs> uh, and then the... Uh, then there's the, what we call the mind, or most people will call it the soul in the West. But really, what they just mean by it are the intellectual faculties, which are wonderful. Just like the human body is a marvel, hmm. 
And the intellectual faculties are, are tremendous. I mean, today you can change a person's knee or hip. You can go to the moon. You can do a, all mm. kinds of extraordinary things with the mind. Mm. But then there's the spirit. Mm. And that's that part of us. We say it's located in the heart. Is it biologically located there or not? Doesn't matter. We call it the heart. Uh, and that is only where you and God communicate. Mm. As we communicate, we start off generally by doing all the talking. <laughs> God, I need this, and God, give me that, and da, 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 da. Until we realize, well, we not only have a spiritual tongue, we also have spiritual ears, and we can learn to listen. And that's where the communion with God becomes much more intense, and where the work of theosis, what we call theosis, or the divinization of the soul, or we also call it the Christification of the soul. And even where deification, we are, you, I, you, you use the term deification as well. Um, right, because it's like, it's like uh, <clears throat> in Psalm 82, in the Old Testament, <clears throat> it says, you are gods, mm. with a small g. Yeah. And our Lord repeats that verse, to, and he says, it is written, you are gods. And then we, we realize that we are much more than just what we think we are. Mm. That our, our relationship with the divine is becomes so elevated and intimate. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, that we, we are transformed. We become transformed. This is... This uh, is a... How shall I... Yes. No, no, please carry on. This, this is so interesting. Well, how, how shall I say? For example, you know, this, the, uh, in, the, in the gospel, they speak of the transfiguration of Christ. Christ mm. goes up to Mount Tabor. He's with uh, Peter, John, and James. And then Christ becomes altogether luminous. So luminous, they cannot bear to see that light. They all fall to the ground. Mm. And uh, they think this is going to be the end of them. And then uh, Christ appears to them with Elijah and Moses on both sides. And it's very curious because both Elijah and Moses speak of the divine light. Uh, Moses on Mount Sinai, God appears to him as light. And so luminous that when he came down from the mountain, his face was so bright, people couldn't look at him. Hmm. And Elijah went up into a chariot of fire, a chariot of light. <laughs> and so we come to realize, <coughs> excuse me, that, you know, ultimately with a capital L, God is light. Hmm. And our divine eyes begin to see that as we're actually transformed. And, this, and transfigured. And transfigured. The light was there. Christ had the light. He just didn't manifest it to the apostles until that moment. Just because as that we point. have light and have got to begin to manifest it. Exactly, and, and um, I don't know if you've heard Andrew Harvey speak, but I know some of, some of the people in our, in our group tonight will have heard him giving a talk here a couple of weeks ago, and he's currently giving a lot of talks and workshops, and has written a book uh, too, which is, um, which is coming out in, in November. And his whole thing is that now is the time for us, for humanity to start really focusing on this transfiguration process and that it's been one of the sort of secrets uh in the heart of sort of esoteric uh, religions if you like in the heart of religions that mm -hmm. that um and and i remember I, I think i'm right in saying that when i when i lived in new zealand that in the maori tradition there's this concept of humans becoming gods and um and you find it in all sorts of traditions uh mm -hmm. in the jain tradition too and so um, do you feel that the peculiar times, the, the very challenging times we're living in, and when I say challenging, I'm thinking in terms of the environmental crisis and, uh, uh, you know, and the pandemic and the overpopulation and, the, you know, um, is this a time where we really need to start focusing on this process of transfiguration? I think we're going to be obliged to do it mm. if we're going to surprise be, uh, if we're going to continue to survive, the uh, 
you know, people say, well, we're anxious for the pandemic to be over so we can go back to life as it was before. Mm. There's no going back. Yeah. There's no going back. Um, the uh, Speaking of, of Harvey, I didn't actually hear his talk, and I'm sorry I didn't. <clears throat> but uh, I read one of his books on Rumi, precisely. Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, the uh, Or his talk. It was a recorded talk that he gave, which was a beautiful, beautiful talk that he, he gave. And yes. uh, it's one, one of the things that helped me understand Rumi precisely. Oh, that's uh, wonderful. Yeah. So, so I'm looking at the time now, and the time has flown, and and it's that's um, because I'm a chatterbox. 